So um, thank you, Inigo. That was like a really, probably the broadest introduction I've ever had. Um, so I want to um, shape this more as a kind of open conversation. Um, step in or chip in any time that you want to. Um, I'm actually in the process right now of trying to bring all of the different threads of the work that I'm doing together somehow. Um, my practice so far has been quite experimental. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> has been quite experimental and quite intuitive. Um, there are probably two um, forms or methodologies that somehow anchor my work. So I'm just going to introduce them to you, one now and one a little bit later. Um, one is um, the title of this lecture, was, which is the Ayan, um, which is drum poetry. Um, it's a form, when I did, I did my master's in African art history, um, and I was studying Ghanaian or African art, and all of the terms and terminologies that we're using to describe and talk about the art um, that we were looking at were hermeneutics, phenomenology, semiotics, all these Western theories. And so I began to ask myself, what were the terms on which these artworks um, were created? What contexts were they created in? Obviously, there wasn't so much in writing um, because everything that was documented was very much uh, post-colonial. And so I looked at, started looking into oral histories and, and um, literatures and came across this one musical language, which was the ayan, the drum poetry, in which all these philosophies and histories um, were encapsulated in this language that was told on the drum. And I'm going to show you, rather than describe it because it's quite hard to understand, Chui, my language is a tonal language. And so there's two drums, as you'll see, um, one male and one female, and the drums mimic the, the tones of language. Um, and there are some things that are said on the drum that are not said in language. Um, the form of it is, was very inspiring to me because it was... Um, it wasn't the way that history is told in the West, which is, or I know there's not just one way of history telling, but the dominant form of history telling, which was linear, um, which was very much about facts and dates. This form of history, history telling was elliptical. Um, it was what was not said was as important as what was said. It was cyc it was cyclical um, in its form, so it didn't just follow follow a straight line. Um, it was um, flexible um, in terms of you could. You could put poems, you could move poems around to retell and tell and tell again stories every time that you played. Um, also, what was interesting was that there was transferred subjectivity. The eye of the poem could be your embodied eye, but it could also be an eye of somebody centuries ago. So it's that kind of transference of subjectivity as well, which I found interesting. The eye could be a man, it could be a woman. There was a kind of flexibility of meaning and of, of, of space that I found really interesting. Um, so I'm going to play you the film before I move on. It's a very, very short film. And actually, it's the very, very first film I ever made. So it looks a little bit dated now. But it's the one still that grapples, um, I think, most directly with the Ayan. Um, what I try to do is I come from a kingdom in Ghana called Atimabuakwa, where we have um, um, divine drummers, divine drummers. And I filmed these young drummers talking on the drum. And then um, I guess try to kind of make a um, comparison or parallel between historical forms of education, which usually took place in the palace, and then contemporary ones, um, which took place in schools and universities. So you'll see that happening. And at the time I took made this film, which was 2006, I think, um, there was a clip, there was a solar eclipse. Um, and I really liked this idea of this metaphor of the passing over of past and present. And it's, it's my first film, so it's very young, but you'll see. It's only very short, it's like four minutes. Um, this. Thank you. 
That's it. Um, so, so um, with this film, it's probably the film that I've most closely, or the work that I've most closely tried to mimic the form of the ayan, which is that um, it's cyclical, there's movement, there's stillness, and there's movement. And so I literally tried through the form of a film to translate what the drummer is doing on the drum into a film language. Um, so I'll now go into how... Um, that kind of fed into the rest of practice. Does anyone have any questions about the drum language before I move on? Or maybe you want to ask at the end? Okay. So, um, I worked at, when I was still living in London, I live in Accra now, um, I worked for a while at the British Museum, um, and there were these, you know, the atom palm, the talking drum behind the glass cases, and then I'd go home, and I'd see the atom palm or the talking drum in the courtyards um, of, of uh, you know, in this case, the palace. Um, this drum, for example, is a, is a few, is at least 140 years old. Um, and you'll see, not in the front, but at the back of it, you'll see like holes in it, you'll see dust, and it's kept in a special place, but it's not temperature controlled. It's not, um, you know, removed from people. It's brought out at festivals um, at least once or twice a year. Um, and one thing I found really interesting, the same with this, this is a um, war smoke or a batter curry um, in a museum. And then this is one on one of my cousins, actually, which is also quite an old one that comes out. Um, and one of the things that I found really interesting about 
this different form of historicizing was, um, you know, it's, it's always so privileged, the archive, the idea of the archive, the idea of preserving things in museums, in archives, of keeping them away from people, of keeping them at certain temperatures. Um, what value did this other form of historicization have? And I'm still asking myself that because to a certain extent, I, I also have a preoccupation with the archive with this encyclopedia that I'm trying to do. But at the same time, I'm trying to bring in this open-endedness, this kind of flexibility of preservation, um, this, in a way, other way of, of thinking about history in which you let the thing, like let time into the equation um, rather than freezing it. Um, this is, um, we have, in English, we have strange words for these um, get-togethers. Um, we call them derbas, which is a colonial term that came from India. We call them festivals, which doesn't really describe them very well either. Um, the tree word for it is afashia, which means the meeting of the year, um, which is probably the closest translation. Um, this, is, this happened last year at the end of last year, and the two men that you see at the top, the Ashantahini and the, and, the, um, Ashant and the Ochihini, are two kings of very ancient kingdoms, and the one had chopped off the head of the other in the 17th century, so he hadn't crossed the river to come and see him, and this is the first time they'd been coming together. And the, the cloth that you see on the Ashantahini is, I think, 300 years old. Again, it's... It's this kind of completely different way of dealing with objects. And these, these occasions that you see is when all of these objects, all of these designs, all of these materials come out. They're, um, they're these kind of total works of art, where, or Gesamtkunstwerke, as Boyce would say, where you have poetry, you have music, you have design, you have art. Um, and so when I experienced this and looked at it, I, I, I thought again, how can we translate in a way this historical way of being into something that's contemporary and that also takes into mind the museum, other ways of, 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 of historicizing, other ways of expressing culture. With a few friends um, in 2011, um, started a, Charlie, a festival, a contemporary art festival. Um, it's called the Charlie Water Festival. It's now become hugely popular. I think tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people come to it every year. But it was really started with a bunch of people sitting in a room thinking about the same thing. Um, our museum space is right for our context. Our gallery space is right. At the time, we didn't have any kind of funding. We didn't have any kind of support. A lot of artists were just literally making stuff in the streets. So we thought, how do we bring this together in the same way that museums and gallery spaces bring artists and artworks together, but do it in a way that is, not, I hate that word authentic, but it's contextual to us. Um, and so this is the Charlie Water Festival. Um, you have kind of, and what I like about it is that it, it, it kind of collapses times as well. You have the past, so you have the kind of historical parades and rituals and, and, and things like that happening at the same time as you have contemporary artworks. So the three at the bottom are three contemporary artists, Serge, Bernard, and Elizabeth. And then the, the, the ones at the top are um, parades that have been happening for centuries and centuries. And you have these two happening at the same time in this festival. Um, I started to think um, at some point as well how, because what I, I, I have this love-hate me, um, relationship with museums. Um, in one way, you know, there are these calcifying graveyards of where objects go to die. Um, and then on the other hand, they are these contain spaces which you can enter into and be transformed, um, and they can be quite transcendent in a way. And so I thought, how can I bring what's of value from the museum or the gallery space into my context and still make it something that is um, applicable or something that people can still relate to, relatable? Um, and so I don't know if anyone's been to West Africa, you'll see, you know that these kiosks on every single corner. Um, they are bars, they are seamstresses, they are mechanics, they are hotels, they're everything that you can think of is in a kiosk. 
Um, and so when I was thinking about what form would I use, I thought, well, the kiosk is the most obvious one because it's the one that's least intimidating, it's the one that's most ubiquitous, um, and it's the one that's in a way most open to people. Um, and so I created the kind of museum in a kiosk, first of all, with an architect called D.K. Oseosari, who's a brilliant Ghanaian architect. Um, and then I did a kind of research exhibition um, at this space that I had at the time um, and worked with um, four artists, really thinking about the structure of the kiosk, the... Oops. Um, the structure of the kiosk, the, you know, like Yao, for example, um, almost like um, in a biological scientific study, went and really looked at all the different forms of kiosks that there are, and did the study. Latifa, who I'm working with still now, and she was like 19 at the time, did, um, went around the whole country looking at different types of kiosks and kind of creating a typology of them. And then DK, um, who, who created this was just looking at how can he contemporize the form of the kiosk. And then in to that same year, we brought the kiosk to the Chaliwate Festival. Um, and I'd gone around the, uh, the community looking at collecting objects, documents, photographs from within that community, because I also wanted to ask people, you know, what is of cultural value to you? Um, rather than imposing this idea of this is a museum, I'm going to curate something and you have to come and see it and hold it of value because I've decided you have, um, what is it that you hold of value and in what way should I best represent it? Um, and so that's what I did with this and it was kind of, it was quite overwhelming actually. Um, it, it, it did even far better than I thought in terms of people coming in. Um, at some point, Sement, and actually I made a film of this, um, of, of this whole thing, but Sement, who's an artist, but he's also a priest of the water in, in Accra, and he came to the kiosk at some point, he's like, I'm going to come to your shrine in a second to do a ritual, and I was like, this, this isn't a shrine, he's like, it is, I'm coming, I'm coming back in a second. And so... Like, you know, people are coming in to, to see the artworks, and before I knew it, he comes and he's wrapped in a white sheet, and he's got, you know, a parade of people behind him, and they're all carrying these baskets on their head, and he kind of gets, throws everybody out of the kiosk, and he puts the thing down, he closes the door. And so for about 15 or 20 minutes, and he does this ritual where he kind of, like, puts the water on somebody three times. He makes me kind of put my hands in the water and kind of bathe him like to cleanse him, because suddenly I've become the priestess of the shrine, he tells me. And so the, the, the museum, the kiosk suddenly takes on a completely different form. Um, and yeah, I kind of, I really like this um, about the mobile museum, that it's unpredictable, it shapes itself according to the context that we're in. We did it again in the next year where we collaborated with a photographer, Ofe Amagavi, who traveled around the country documenting different festivals. And then um, this is um, the beginning of us doing, deciding that we were gonna take the Mobile Museum all around the country. Um, and so we did a recce, I traveled all 10 regions of the country asking people, and again did a film about this, what is art to you? What is culture to you? Um, and we asked everyone from fishermen to weavers to priests to monks to malams to children to um, curators and lecturers to uh, every kind of person. We asked, what is art? What is culture to you? Um, and how would you like it to see it represented? Does it, is it applicable to your life in any way? This is some of the methodologies that we used in trying to collect information. You can't really see it now. It's, I don't really want to go into it. Um, and this is a new structure that a um, uh, young architect, Latifa, she's meanwhile, she, I think she's about 24, 25 now. Um, she created this new mobile museum for, for us because um, we wanted a structure that you can um, take apart and put on the back of a truck. And so you can with this. And what I love about this as well is that um, Latifa, I think, is diabetic and she gets very sick periodically. And so she kind of wove the biography of her sickness into the structure itself. So those white 
um, squares or rectangles that you see are periods when she had to rest or when she was exhausted. And I really liked with that as well that she kind of took the kind of objective idea of architecture and turned it into something very personal and subjective as well. And so this is what the mobile museum looks like now. When I get back to Accra next week, we're just about to set off with it. These are the kind of objects that we're um, exhibiting in it. Um, we also um, work, the whole idea is that we, I didn't want to create a space that was um, separate from people. Um, we wanted to, like, there are new spaces opening up in, in Accra, independent art spaces, um, but they're in a way very much replicating the um, forms that we have in the West of these white cube spaces where, you know, very few people go. They all drink wine at openings, um, you know, pat each other on the back. It's like, you know, the arts community, you go home, you know, and then it all happens again the next month. Um, so we really thinking about what kind of space can we create that actually does have some kind of impact or exchange with people in communities. And so we've started now um, doing research um, into, you know, like some of the um, issues that contemporary artists that we're working with with the museums throw up, um, how we have discussion forums, um, we ask people, we do NGO fairs, um, we, we, like it's actually become quite scientific. We measure what the impact is because we're really in a way trying to create a new form that hasn't really existed before. And therefore we almost need to be quite scientific in it because in, if we succeed in what we're doing, um, it could provide a, a model for other people. So we're, we're actually documenting quite um, intensely what we're doing. Which brings me to the Culture Encyclopedia. So the Culture Encyclopedia actually came out of an idea where I was working with David, Ajay, um, on an exhibition in Brussels. Um, and also I wrote an essay. He did it, this thing where he traveled. David Ajay is a Ghanaian architect. He's done very well for himself. And um, he traveled around, across all 54 countries um, of Africa. And he asked me to write an essay for the book that he did, which I did. And then he asked me to come on board for an exhibition that he was doing in Brussels um, and um, kind of provide, in a way, the narrative of the exhibition in some way or the research. Um, and while I was doing that, um, I, 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 I kind of thought, why not do this for the whole continent? Create a kind of compendium of... Because after this, actually, after I did the exhibition with David, I went on a tour with a group called Invisible Borders from, um, and this came out of that, actually. And we went by road from Nigeria to Ethiopia. Um, and we went by donkey, by car, by motorbike. Um, and everywhere I went, I would ask people about, you know, the arts and the culture. And even though it's somewhere like Addis Ababa, Ethiopia is very, very rich in culture. It has, you know, the Coptic scrolls. It has a, huge, a long, long history of photography, obviously the architecture. Um, there was nowhere where you could really find information on this. And so out of these two encounters and also doing research, um, I came up with this idea of doing a pan-African encyclopedia. And I had an idea that it would be something like there's 54 volumes, one for every country. Um, there was a lot of, um, we had a lot of discussions. Um, I kind of got together, um, actually I have that in another slide, a lot of um, people to discuss things, you know, where are we going to get the funding from? What languages are we going to use? Uh, is, the, is the paradigm of country one that is actually suitable when there, it's a colonial construct? Um, we're still thinking through a lot of these things. Um, last year, um, I talked to and interviewed um, these two artists that I've known for a very, very long time, who are also musicians, um, and what I would have termed before traditional priests. When I, when I talked to them, and they haven't been that forthcoming with me over the years in terms of knowledge. It's only really now, after knowing them for maybe like, I don't know, almost 10 years, that they're starting to open up to this knowledge. Um, 
um, when I went to talk to them, they said, actually, we're not traditional priests, we're knowledge keepers, because we didn't have religious systems historically, we had knowledge systems. And so they started to break down this very complex knowledge system for me, um, and told me that, and as I started doing research, I realized it was a pan-African knowledge system that was you know, in the West, in the West Africa, as well as East and other parts of Africa. Um, it was made up of the arts, of education, of psychology, of mythology, of cosmology. Those were the kind of six, um, and spirituality at the top. Those are the six main components. Um, and each component had like six hermetic schools of knowledge. And those schools would be like the school of nature, the school of, um, the school of the soul and the creator. It was a really, really, really complex system. And I was quite mind blown when I came across this system because I was like, in a way, this is what I've been looking for all of these years is a way of an ontology, a way of thinking, a way of mediating, a way of seeing that has grown of us um, and in a way that, that provides a way of understanding and mediating the world. Um, like I said, it's a very, very complex. They said to me that, you know, now that I've started studying it, it's going to take me seven years to at least begin to be able to explain it properly. So I've still got quite a while to go. But what I've started doing is we had the encyclopedia already, the culture encyclopedia online already, but I, start, I started um, to shift the categorization because before already I was having some problem with how do I categorize this knowledge? Um, like I said, you know, do we do it by country, but that's a colonial construct? Do we do it by, you know, how do we start to categorize cultural knowledge on the continent? And so what I've done now is I've, taken the historical knowledge system and de-secularized de it, like desacralized it. So the, the knowledge system in its essence is very, very esoteric in a way, like many knowledge systems are. And so what I've done now is I've taken the esoteric out um, to a certain extent and used the categories to start to format the culture encyclopedia. Um, yeah, I think this is kind of coming to the end. This was, um, yeah, I think I kind of geared this, this talk more towards like the museum work that I've been doing. So this is just, we had this exhibition, Future Museums, that's the director of the British Museum, he came. Um, this is just also showing, um, you know, the work that we're doing in terms of deconstructing the idea of the museum. This is the exhibition that I curated um, this year in Venice with David Ajay as architect and Okwi and Wezo as strategic advisor. Um, and in a way, I think um, this was kind of a template for thinking about new structures um, because David took some of the historical forms of architecture that we have, especially still in the northern region, um, and we started to think about what might a future museum in Ghana look like. Um, and this is a, a, a thing, a project I'm working on right now, which is a castle from the 7th century that's being turned into a museum. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I focused, I kind of focused or tailored this talk more towards the museum because I thought this is an architectural school, so maybe you'll be interested more in the structural um, elements of things. But um, like Inigo was saying, um, my practice is quite multi-layered. Um, I do the films as well and the fiction and the art historical writing. And the reason I started with the Ayan was, um, for me, it's such a great model of thinking um, about how to process um, and also how to create a new way of thinking because the Ayan, so my uncle, my great uncle, no, yeah, my great grandfather and also my uncle were both Odumonkumatruma, which is divine drummers. Um, and so they were the keepers of the history of our kingdom. Um, and the interesting thing about the divine drummer is that he, I would say he or she, but women aren't allowed to be divine drummers, um, are, you know, they are, 
these keepers of this quite, the keepers of history, they're the ones that transmit history. They do it in this very poetic way. Um, they, they are creators of these poems, but they're also the creators of their context. Um, and so in a way, um, I see myself in that lineage of, of, of the kind of divine drama, even though I'm not supposed to be, um, because I'm a woman. Um, but I remember when my uncle has passed away now, but I remember when he was still alive, I asked him, please let me touch these drums, you know? And he's like, no, you're a woman, you can't touch them. And so, you know, after a while as well, like after, and the reason, um, I, actually I should explain why this is. Um, it sounds like we're, we're an incredibly sexist society, which we are to some extent, but not completely. Um, but the reason this was is because the drums are, oh God, where do I start? So in our cosmology, um, we, in our kind of historical cosmology, we believe that every single object, um, element is imbued with beingness. So um, everything has a spirit of some kind, a river, a stone, the earth, a tree. Um, and so when you fell the tree, you know, you, you pour libation and you, you know, you, you talk to the spirit of the tree and you say, um, you know, I'm going to um, you ask it, you know, you ask it permission, I'm going to fail you, do I have permission, etc. And if like that axe falls out of your hand and comes back and knocks you on the head, that means you don't have the permission, I guess. But, um, and then every time you start drumming as well, you, 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 you speak first of all to the spirit of all the elements that the drum is made up of. Um, one of the other things that you do is that you sacralize the drum. We use a lot of, um, like, so in a lot of the ceremonies that I've been to now that I'm trying to kind of learn about the knowledge system, I'm vegetarian. Um, and the first ceremony I went to, they literally like chopped the neck of a chicken into, and it was like flailing around, you know, blood squirting out of its hair, its body. And I was like, God, I don't know if I can, you know, do this whole apprenticeship. If it's gonna be like, you know, animal barbarism, um, and they said, okay, we can do it with flowers instead if you really want to. Um, so, but what we do with how we sacralize um, objects normally is with blood. Um, so the blood of an animal. Um, and I don't know, this is quite an interesting area actually because I, you know, Ghana is a highly Christian country and when you go to churches in Ghana, they're always talking about the blood, you know. I, I, I put this in the blood of Jesus, the blood of, and I, I think there's quite an interesting connection between the two, um, how blood is seen as this purifying element. But anyway, um, so the blood of the the blood is kind of put onto the drum to sacralize it and 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 make it into something of this world and also of the other. And the reason that women can't touch objects or um, go like I remember sitting once um, outside the palace on a, there was a stone and I was about to sit next there and someone kind of ran across the square saying don't sit on that stone you'll be barren forever um, there's all these and they take it very 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 seriously and um, so I kind of jumped up and, and said okay um, but the reason I wasn't allowed to touch the drum was because women bleed and our blood is seen as being more powerful than the blood of the animal that's being um, that's been used to sacralize the drum. So when I touch the drum, what I'm doing in a way, so it's not actually that I'm seen as inferior and that's not why I'm allowed to touch the drum, it's that I'm actually too powerful to touch the drum. So my power as a woman who bleeds once a month, um, in a way, overrides the blood of the drum that's used, been, been used to sacralize it, which is why I'm not allowed to touch it. There was once I was allowed to play them, but my, my um, uncle had to have a sheep slaughtered because I was so adamant that I wanted to play it. And he's like, okay, we can do it, but we have to slaughter a sheep. And I said, okay. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of why I'm not physically allowed to be a divine drama in the kind of whole um, kind of hierarchy of, of, of telling stories. Um, so yeah, just to kind of conclude it, I think, um, I think my practice in the, as a whole is, is really comes down to storytelling. And I think that 
if you read the, get the book and read it as well, there's a lot of questions about, um, and I had that a lot when I was living here, you know, who gets to tell stories? Who gets to be the, the conveyor of stories? Who has the power to decide which stories are allowed to, allowed to be told? Um, and I've asked myself this in my own context, in the Ghanaian context, where I, as a woman, am in a way not allowed to be a storyteller historically in, that, in this particular format. And then also in the Western context where um, the stories that the stories of our, our stories, and, and I'm, I'm not quite sure who I mean by ours, but were in a way seen as louder, as not as valid, as the kind of dominant story or narrative that was told. Um, so in a way, I think I'm trying to um, deconstruct this idea of the dominance of narrative and of um, the hegem hegem hegemony of storytelling um, by fragmenting it through different ways of storytelling, but also um, through experimenting with finding something that's new um, and that I'm not quite sure what it is yet, um, but I kind of, kind of like experimenting and grounding it in some way in the Ghanaian historical ontology and trying to create something new out of that. That's kind of a hybrid of, of, of what I found in the West as well. Um, and it's quite an interesting journey. I, I'm, I'm quite interested myself to see what will come, what will come out of it. It's still very much a work in, in progress. So that's it, I think. Um, Do you have any questions or comments or, yeah? Um, I have a question uh, about the... Great. Um, I have a question about the mobile museums. Uh, uh, when, so the way that I guess it works is that they're essentially decentralizing the museum mm. in the sense that they are moving from one place to another and you're bringing the museum, I guess, to specific communities yeah. rather yeah. than the museum, which I think historically has been like, and I guess historically in accordance to the Western model, kind of a centralized space, usually in a city for a specific group of people mm -hmm. that can access it. And I, and I guess I wanted to ask um, how, if that's something that you're doing consciously, like trying to sort of spread the knowledge out spatially as well and mm. not just be in one contained space, mm. but to be kind of everywhere mm. at the same time or, uh, yeah. So thinking about that and like how successful you found moving the museum from space to space or do you feel like it's a matter of having multiple smaller kind of instances like this or, it's, or, or, if, or if it's something that you want to continue as like short term and then it gets taken down and taken somewhere else. Well, I mean, I think physically it would be impossible for me to do this in perpetuity myself, um, just because I, I have finite energy. Um, in an ideal world, it would be great, I think, if, um, if in some way it could continue. But we actually do have regional museums in Ghana. It's just that they're not used, nobody goes to them. Um, they have no connection to the people around them or the communities. They've literally just tried to replicate the museums that they've seen in the West, and people are not interested. Um, I mean, I really love this process of going around and going into communities because you learn so much. Um, and I think if that's something that I definitely want to keep, this idea of open knowledge. And, and you know, I, I don't really like the idea of, for example, the curator as somebody that comes at, with an idea before the thing, you know, and, and knows, um, or the thinker, and knows what something is before they've even explored it. Um, what I really like about the Mobile Museum is that it really, it's quite a humble space. And because of that, it, it's quite an open space. It can go into communities and ask people of them rather than impose on them. Um, and so I don't know how we could keep that kind of spirit um, of openness in a fixed space. I'm not really sure. Um, yeah. I guess, um, I don't know if this is a good question, but a follow-up, because you were talking about how um, 
there are like regional museums in Ghana, but people mm. don't go to them. I think it's the same pretty much in Nigeria and maybe uh, across, I don't know, Africans. I don't want to like generalize, but I was just wondering like if there, what you think about that, like if what possible, I guess, I don't know if the word is solutions, but like what are the steps do we take to either engage with these museums that exist but are not being engaged with, or do we disengage with them and completely start creating new spaces to, I guess, access this culture or knowledge or things, things of that nature? Because I feel like I really like uh, this project. I think it's like very successful, but I'm wondering, again, like, because it's almost like re-evaluating the museum culture for specifically for the context in Ghana and maybe mm. this could also work a lot in West Africa yeah. but I'm wondering if then do we com do we completely I guess disregard the museums that are already exist right now because they're not working um I don't think I mean they're there it would be a shame in a way to disregard them completely yeah. um I just think they need rethinking, and I think it's a real shame. Like, I'm in Ghana, I'm on the Ghana Museum and Monuments Board, and it's such an archaic... It's, like, it's a horrible... Wait, <laughs> <laughs> um, right, let me be diplomatic here, sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, I can I can tell the answer from that. So. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's um, it's uh, it's um. Oh God, okay, that would be dramatic. It's um, the Ghana Museum and Money Events Board is valuable in its own way. Um, <laughs> um but um, it um. <sighs> a way of, you know, like, oh, the museum is what it is in the West. Um, we're just going to keep it like this. We're not going to think outside of the box. Um, we're going to keep this one display that's been in our museum since 1957. We're not going to modernize it. Um, it's just, it's so static. Um, and I don't really know. I mean, trust me, I've tried to kind of you know, and, and I'm actually in a position because I'm on the board. I sit there with them, you know, for hours and hours and hours. And there's almost nothing that you can say or do. Um, so for me, the, the kind of the only way to do it is, for example, when I did Venice and they saw, you know, that um, it had resonance and success, they were suddenly like, oh, maybe we should bring the Venice show to the museum. Whereas I'd been talking about doing things and nobody kind of was was in the in that structure. So I think it's also about showing them what's possible, and I think that's partly what this mobile museum is about, is showing them if we do this, you know, n loads of people come and they're interested and they want to see and they want to engage, and there's programs and you know this is what can happen. Um, so I think it's 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 more a case of doing and then hoping that people grow towards you. Um, because I think if you go into those structures and try and modernize them, you'll die trying. Um, because they're so um, immovable. But maybe that's true of all institutions to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with the white pube? The White Pube? The, oh, you should definitely read it. It's amazing. It's like basically these two, yeah, the right, White Pube. So basically they're just two girls that like critique um, how art institutions are run and like do alternative um, art critics and they review like video games and YouTube channels and stuff okay. like that. Um, no, but they, they publish, I, I, was, I was trying, I was hoping you knew it of it so I can get your thoughts on uh, a few articles they've written recently which was basically talking about their kind of frustrations of the, the whole kind of art system in, in the UK and how it's like basically constant tokenism of having people of color being brought in for like small events and like never but but in a way what they point out and what you know actually genuinely these art institutions find them threatening even though they're like you know they write and chat speak pretty much um 
is that it's really they really really reveal the flaws in the system and why there needs to be you know systematic change one question i was wondering is that do you view this as um inventing a museum kind of or art system you know like how to, how to say like um, yeah museums for ghana specifically or are you kind of proposing an alternative system or way of displaying art in general that could be open to anyone yeah, I think in general, for sure. I mean, I'm starting with Ghana because that's my context, it's what I know. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, like all museums at the moment are going through crises, mm -hmm. you know? They they can't any longer... Oh, you told me to speak, stand next to it. Um, um, <laughs> they can't any longer, um, um, you know, kind of use... The, they can't any longer operate on the imperial models that they were built on mm -hmm. and so I think all museums and I like when you say about the tokenism like I keep getting invited to these workshops on museums and talks on museums and this on museums um, because everybody is in crisis nobody knows um, what what the next step is and I think that's actually a really quite an exciting place to be in, um, in a place where you don't know what comes next. Um, and especially in a space where things have been done so horribly wrong um, to actually be like, I don't know what happens next. And so I think this project in particular is, is, is interesting because it's an experimentation. It's a real, it's, it's in a way, it's a kind of listening um, exercise, um, yeah. And, and also, um, one thing that I could see how, how to say, conceptually, I view this that could be connected to, like, on a more urban scale, let's say. Because one thing I always thought was really ironic and such a massive shame about tourism in general is that, like, these are spaces that are kind of revered as culturally important and significant to the people that exist within this space. However, when you live in London, no one really cares about going anywhere close to Big Ben. Nobody cares about going to Tower of London. Nobody cares about going to these spaces because they're completely colonized by the visitors. They've been kind of, in a way, frozen and put into like a vitrine in the same way that the drama mm. has been. Um, and that, you know, the way that in which we engage with it is not to, how to say, engage with a part of our culture, but to visit the grave or the remnants of culture as it was frozen in that period of time. Mm. And then when you kind of scale up those two di kind of dynamics of that, you know, uh, culture within vitrine, um, where people in urban life do not participate in culturally or socially, socially at all. But then when you look at these kind of living history hubs, when you kind of connect that to where is culture being practiced or lived in a way, in London is the rest of it, which is mm. where we are inhabiting that culture and in fact that operates more as a document of a culture and an embodiment of a culture more so than this uh, apparent like flagged culture in a way. Yeah. So yeah, that's just an observation, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, hi, that was amazing. Um, I guess this is more of a comment than a question, but I loved like how you said about um, how objects, um, artifacts and features, I mean, artifacts are put in museums and they go there to die. Um, yeah, and I'm really interested about how, um, sorry, I'm really nervous in speaking with people. Um, yeah, and how an object can be taken from the past and then be brought into the present. And I thought it was really interesting how um, you were saying, I don't know what it's called, but the attire that your uncle was wearing and how maybe artifacts should be worn and lived and not yeah. like housed in a museum. Yeah. And you're talking about like the future of museums and maybe it's not like objects being like in a graveyard that is the museum, but actually being lived and maybe that becomes the museum, like taking mobility of, of the museum to the next level and having these events actually being the museum lived, like, and maybe the museum is just a place where you see like recordings and pictures of the artifacts themselves being used. I think that's incredible and amazing and 
like yeah I just wanted to yeah, yeah I think um, I think it's really interesting because um, you know I was at um, I was doing this talk this weekend in Oxford and uh, this guy you know that that really irritating thing that some people say in that in the whole museum discourse when they say oh you know but if we give the objects back to you you know will you be able to look after them and I'm just like, you know, I really have to control myself when somebody says something like this. Like, um, you know, I just said to him, you know, um, I, I controlled myself and I said, um, you know, I just, I find it very, um, um, very um, ironic um, when people say, you know, if some, somebody basically has come into my house, stolen my, my, you know, stolen my goods, and then says to me, I don't know if I want to give them, I can give them back to you because you won't know how to look after your own objects or your own things that were yours before I took them. It, how can that even be an argument? I just, I don't even understand how that is even an argument, and yet people, the director of the VNA, you know, so-called experts across the Western world use this as a reason for, for not giving objects back. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is why is it so important to keep objects in glass cases mm. in particular temperatures mm. um, where they just sort of stay there static forever and ever? Why is that so important? Who says it is? Mm. You know, who who's not to say these objects, you know, that were in you know, that, that are in the schoolhouse in this way, which has so much history with it. And, you know, you go to some, one of the elders and they'll tell you, you know, where this hole came from in the object. Um, and, you know, if it falls apart, it falls apart. You know, you create something new. Who's not to say that this kind of eph ephemerality of being is, is as valid as the kind of glass case temperature controlled way of dealing with things. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, yeah, I think this is part of this new moment in a way um, where, you know, some person um, who, who kind of has the gall to say something like this. I mean, I literally want to be in every single room where that comment is made because, I, you know, it, it, it's almost like these, and I have like a picture of the old white man who set, makes this kind of comment. It's like this old, this generic old white man, obviously not every old man is like this, but the one that I'm thinking of who has a beard has sat in his, in his chair for so long and he's so used to hearing, and funny, um, I was speaking with, um, with, at the thing in Oxford, I was speaking with um, a gentleman um, I'll, yeah, I'll tell you about this after. So I was speaking with a gentleman. He was a kind of QC. Um, it was very, it was very interesting experience. Also, people came up to me after the talk and apologized <laughs> because, um, yeah, it, it was almost like a performance of, of something. Um, but it's kind of like this man has sat in this chair for so long. He's so used to hearing his own voice and of having his voice be the right voice and the only voice in the room. Um, and that's why it's so important for me, like that's why I do end up going a lot of the time to these workshops at the British Museum, because I want to be there at that table. And when that man says that kind of comment of, you know, we can't give you objects back, I want to be the one to look him in the face and say, well, actually, um, you know, you stole those objects from us. And, and you know, you, you can't patronize us by saying, we can't give them back to you. Can you actually hear what you're saying? Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with you that there are other ways of telling history, of 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 you know dealing with objects, of exchanging with them, and some that are more organic. And I don't think they're necessarily less valid than the way that's being kind of held up by 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 the dominant voices of the West. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I had a question, which is. Um, I guess about heritage. So um, I guess a lot of these objects or artifacts would be like classified under things to do with cultural heritage, right? And 
Um, earlier in your presentation, you talked about um, not using or being cautious of the idea of nation or country because it is a colonial construct. And I guess, obviously, in Africa, there was, you know, pre-colonial, like, kingdoms and regions that were, you know, that have now been separated. And so because of that, there is a lot of, I guess, heritage of these um, kingdoms and um, that don't exist anymore in that context. So I know that, I guess, one of the questions with in this, in the large debate of, on repatriation and restitution is on, you know, if these countries or regions, kingdoms no longer exist, who do we give the works back to because they don't exist and mm -hmm. things like that. But I mean, my question is not so much about repatriation, but more about, I guess, knowledge sharing. Mm -hmm. So uh, you talked about how you went from Senegal to Ethiopia on the road, like by, by road. And I guess what I'm kind of thinking about is also knowledge sharing kind of like throughout the continent. So how do we interact with these kind of um, histories or regional histories in like between nations in a way? Like how do you talk about kingdoms that no longer exist like and things like that? And how do you share that kind of culture? Does that, I don't know mm. if I'm making any sense. Um, and I, I don't know, I was just thinking like with your uh, mobile museum and things like that, I thought it was interesting not just to think about one specific country, but also to think continentally as well, yeah. how it could work sort of across the continent. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's something that is very much lacking, at least from my experience, mm -hmm. to understand the larger context of the continent yeah. from within, not yeah. from like coming here and going to university and like going to mm. the archives, but to understand that from like the actual continent, to understand these histories that we don't really get, to, that don't really get spoken about. I don't know if is that something that you, you also are looking into with your um, encyclopedia yeah. and things like that, yeah. Yeah, I think um, that's, yeah, very much so. I think um, that was one of the big starting points of the encyclopedia was um, was exactly that. You know, I would go, like I'd be invited to something, to speak at something in Senegal, and, you know, um, with, like, my Senegalese counterparts, like, you know, Felwin, who's done this amazing report, and um, all these kind of great Francophone thinkers, um, and we'd be like, there's no, there's no real cross conversation happening between us in Ghana and you in Senegal, even though we're only a few countries away because of the colonial divide of the Francophone, Anglophone, Lusophone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a, a, that's a huge problem. And I think, I mean, in the way that I'm trying to do it, I'm trying to do it through the culture encyclopedia. That's why I made it a pan-African culture encyclopedia mm -hmm. rather than the Ghanaian one, because there's a lot of, even though there's a lot of differences, there's also a lot of, you know, like common, one thing that really, another thing that really irritates me <laughs> is um, when we refer to Africa as pre-colonial, colonial, post-colonial, post -colonial, when we center the colonial yeah. as the most important chapter of our entire trajectory, when, you know, we are, I think, the oldest, play, play, you know, like when we are, when our history is centuries and centuries and centuries old, mm -hmm. and the colonial chapter was a relatively brief yeah. one, and yet it, managed to center well, yeah. itself as the most important chapter in our history. But do you think that obviously it's because, well, okay, I don't know if this makes sense as a question, but I guess the reason why it gets centered around the, um, the colonial narrative or colonial history is because of the Western way of documenting history. And so maybe I'm thinking, well, at least for me, Whenever, like when I started trying to find things out about Nigeria and Nigerian history and architectural history, the documents that I found were usually written by, I don't know, white people essentially, mm. or like missionaries and things like that, like mm. for my initial, like the first things that I found. And in a way, like all the sketches and things like that were not done by Nigerians. Mm. Like when they sketch the village layout and things like that. So I feel like me, that plays a big part in why you almost, cause it almost feels like there's a point where like 
the history runs out, but that's only because we're looking at just like the tradition of writing. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of oral history that mm -hmm. you don't get to see when you're looking at from this like Western way of documenting things. So I feel like, it, but that's also something that I guess will come with the cultural encyclopedia to understand that histories are not only like kept in one way. Yeah. There are other ways to interact with your, with, with, yeah, with history and lineage, because I think that's probably a big part of why it almost feels like it starts from the colonial narrative. Because in terms of like, if you're looking for things, you're usually at least initially or instinctively looking for books and things like that. Yeah. And it's very hard to find, yeah, books that are not kind of centered around before or after. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And, 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 you know, like even with this knowledge system and even actually when I was talking to my uncle and I was trying to document the drum poems, um, what's really interesting, at least about my context, is that there's so many layers of knowledge and you're not allowed into the knowledge unless you've really shown a commitment and a seriousness. So, you know, even with my own blood, my own family, it wasn't until I'd shown like quite a few years of dedication that he started opening up certain layers. And even so, he died without opening everything up to me um, because I wasn't ready. Um, and so, I think to keep in mind as well that we have this idea of, and I think there's even a book by a woman called Karen Barber called something like, um, something about secrecy and knowledge and power. Um, this idea, like sometimes we obfuscate knowledge. You know, a lot of the time when you read these anthropological um, books, you know, people are saying, oh, they weren't straightforward or there wasn't anything there. Sometimes we don't want to share that knowledge um, because, you know, there's, I think, very much the feeling that knowledge is power, and if you're not ready for that power, you shouldn't have that knowledge. And so, in a way, there's a kind of, there's, there's a completely different value mediation going on, um, at least in the research that I've done, where you're not just, you, it's not just like you go into the library and you pick up a book and then you find it, it's like you have to be really serious about it um, and quite dedicated and be willing to put the time and the energy over a long period before different layers of knowledge become accessible to you. And that's what I really like about the drum poetry as well. It's, it's, a, it's a really good metaphor for that because when you just hear the drum beating, you think, oh, it's just music. You don't know it's speaking a language. And then you learn the language and you might know the kind of, you know, the few of the poems and then, but then there's, there's all these layers of entry, but then there's this whole kind of other layer of meaning you don't get until you become a divine drummer. And then you can really become a master drummer because you're drumming the meaning, the deeper meaning of the poems to people. And so I think, again, there's a difference in how we mediate and his you know I, I I can't think of a better word than historicize but like how we meet yeah how we mediate knowledge you know we've so used to this western way of going into the library picking up a book and there it is for us but it's not the only way um and I think this yeah I think kind of cultivating an openness to other ways of discovering because like once I started going into this, there's a whole corpus of knowledge. It's not that we've lost knowledge. Um, it's that it's kind of morphed into other things. And there's, I mean, like I, I, I'm going to spend a lifetime learning about this. Um, so it's not that it's not there. It's just that it's differently accessible. Um, and I think, you know, if we, if, you know, you want to, or somebody wants to, look into it, it's, it's about having perseverance and patience and dedication. Um, and in a way, kind of circumventing, knowing that, you know, the Western way of the, all the kind of colonial documents and stuff are there and they're valuable in their own way, but there's also something else alongside it. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about the way that you phrased the fact that objects come into museums to die. 
And I look at it also from the point of view that objects come into the museum as they are dying and that the museum collects somehow samples of objects in order to pass on the heritage and the cultural knowledge. So I was wondering about your take on this as a concept. What do you mean that dying? So from my cultural experience, from where I'm from, most of the objects where are you that- Where from? I'm Romanian. Okay. Most of the objects that are in uh, ethnographic museums, let's say, are taken from places where the history of the objects start to die, so people don't use them anymore. Okay. And they're placed in the museum as a token to the past, mm -hmm. but they also usually raise interest again in the objects themselves, so it's a bit like a resuscitation of the item, which I find interesting. That's really interesting. Um, that's really interesting. I've, I've, I actually haven't thought about it like that. I mean, I've been into a lot of storerooms, which, um, you know, when I, when I said that objects were dead, I've been into storerooms, like at the Humboldt Museum in Germany, where you go in and you actually like, ugh, you get this kind of weird feeling because there are all these sacred objects and you feel kind of this energy emanating of them and you kind of realize, you know, like I've been in workshops with um, indig so-called indigenous experts as well where, you know, they, which, yeah, um, um, where they say, you know, um, you know, these objects have a spirit or, you know, they, they you know, especially with, um, I was at a thing at the Pitt Rivers a couple of months ago where um, there was a Native American a uh, man who said, you know, this object doesn't want to be here. It's, a, it's my ancestor. Um, and so to a certain extent, like, I think objects go to die, but to a certain extent also, I don't know, you know, like, what, what the uh, nature of these objects are, you know. If somebody says that they're imbued with something and that they're, they're actually, you know, somebody was saying that this is, this is not an object, it's, it's, it's a being, it's imbued, and you're basically keeping this being in a cage and that object is not dead. Um, it's being, it's been captured in some way. Um, I think it's a really interesting point, the idea of and that's the point that all the kind of restitution apologists um, make as well, that if you didn't, I was at, I was at a meal with somebody and ended up having a kind of quite an argument with that person um, where he was saying, oh, you know, but if we hadn't preserved those objects for you, um, then, you know, nobody would have access to them now. Nobody would see them, you know. We did you a favor by taking them. You no, know, but in our case, it's at home, so. Sorry? In our cases, it's at home, so it's not okay. taken over by someone Okay, so else. That's, that's a different dynamic, and, you know, it's a tricky one, I think, because obviously there's, there's value and merit to some extent of people being able to see things that might have not be, they might not be able to see in their daily lives because they've either become extinct or they're from a culture many, many places away. There's some value to that. I think it's just how you do it, you know? I think if you do it with honesty, if you do it with transparency, if you do it, you know, like right now the problem with museums in the West is that they're so patronizing and they're so dishonest, you know? A lot of the time they don't honestly say how they got those objects, you know, by looting and murder, et cetera. Um, like have honesty, have transparency, and then you can start actually speaking about how can we create structures that are valuable to all of us? Because like you say, there is, there can be value in, 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 in museum spaces, I guess. Uh, also, um, there was a really interesting thing where you were describing kind of the cultural practices surrounding the drum and like blood and etc. because I could feel there was a lot of parallels with like, um, how to say, um, which what I, kind of like, beliefs that we have, I'm, I'm from Brunei, by the way, mm -hmm. um, beliefs that we have there, and I'm, in a way, like, not of Brunei, let's say I'm a completely a product of colonialism, Chinese coolie labor brought over, blah, 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 so when it comes to, like, 
when you said focusing on colonialism as the kind of starting part of the history, like as the focal point of history, like for my point of view, I don't know. That is the genesis of where I began in a way, so I, I focus on it quite a lot. But, but anyhow, like ignoring that. Um, when you're speaking with that stone and like sitting on the stone, I could feel there were a lot of parallels of kind of cultural practices we have in Brunei, where if you want to, like, I don't know, <laughs> if you really need to pee and there's no toilet, like, and you want to pee, like, by a bush or something, you're supposed to ask for permission as well. Like, you're supposed to, but the belief is basically, well, this is the way my mom told me, and I have no idea whether this is the actual belief, but she says that you need to ask permission if in case there's, like, spirits there, so you don't piss on their feet by accident. Mm -hmm. That's how she told me. But then also we have beliefs of, like, if you're in the in the forest and you're walking in the forest, you're not allowed to. If you want to talk to, talk to your friend or like like yell at your friend to call them over or something, you're not supposed to say their name. You're just supposed to say you and like point to them or like really try and get their attention without using their name. And the belief is that oh, if, if you're calling their name, there might be a spirit in the forest that has the same name that might respond um, instead of that person. So in a way, when it comes to kind of, and, and to me, like, I don't view this as like some sort of belief or whatever. It is, I fully embody this. I just treat it as a fact. I practice all of this. And when you were saying that this is not, how to say, belief, it's knowledge, and you're desacralizing it, that is exactly the way that um, I've viewed it because actually, upon kind of further investigation, these are these beliefs that I talked about. And also this thing about not sitting objects because you're a female and you have periods and therefore your blood is tainting something. We have the same thing as well. When you're not allowed to sit on certain objects, you're not, you're not allowed to sit on tables as a female as well or visit sacred spaces when it's the time of the month or whatever. But what I found out was that these were remnants of beliefs that were left over from the Muruk and Iban tribe in Brunei, which unfortunately t today has lost all of these kind of cultural belief systems. And these are the last remnants that remain in the culture that just happen to be the fact of the land that then everyone brought together under colonial conditions just agreed upon and you know, embodied together. So this is not something that's exclusive to Iban and Murat people. This was then transmitted to all the other kind of people who were brought together through colonialism. Mm. And that became actual knowledge and not just belief in a way. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because um, actually I, I kind of looked at this in my novel. Um, the girl who grows up here is subject is kind of like you say you know when your mother says these things to you if this was in the west country might, somebody might be like oh that's so superstitious but when you're told these things it's reality it's like fact there might be spirit in the bushes and you might be on its feet that it's told to you as if it's just truth and i think um that's what i've tried to do in the novel as well is kind of show this n n notion of expanded reality that you know we believe that there's not just this visible world that there's a kind of you know that our ancestors live in the world alongside us and those that are not born are there too that they kind of inhabit different planes that we are we're all here and actually the godchild the term the godchild in Ghana is somebody who has openness to the different planes, who who seems really precocious as a child because they know things that they're not meant to know. Um, and yeah, I kind of wanted to quite subtly, not in, not in a way that was kind of magical realism, because I think for me that goes a bit far because it, it's such a magical world that it seems like it can't be real. But to kind of, to explore that notion of an expanded reality as reality, but as if it's just straightforward, as if it's nothing extraordinary. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to stop it there, actually. Nana, thank you so much. But there's drinks and snacks upstairs, so we can continue the conversation up there. But I'd really encourage everyone, firstly, thank you so much to Nana for coming tonight. It's been really amazing.